Welcome everyone to our online platform. Hope you're all safe and healthy. I am Armin Arugian, the founding CEO of Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology. Thanks for joining our webinar entitled COVID-19, the success and pathways for global cooperation that has gathered distinguished speakers from five countries, including Armenia, Germany, Japan, UK, and the USA. Our talk is held in partnership with the, with the Future Studio, an independent nonprofit organization that hosts discussions on various topics and conducts socio socioeconomic research. Before presenting my honorable guests, I would like to remind you that you can join us live on Zoom if you have pre-registered or through live streaming on Facebook. Please note that only participants who registered via Zoom will have access to Armenian simultaneous interpretation. If you have questions, feel free to write us in the comments. And now let me introduce you our esteemed speaker, starting from our beloved president and the, from the host country, Armenia. His Excellency Dr. Armin Sarkisian, president of Republic of Armenia, is a theoretical physicist and mathematician complemented with deep practical and theoretical knowledge of transition economies and state building processes. Prior to the presidency, His Excellency has helped states, the private sector, and international organizations to overcome some of the most difficult internal and external exchanges facing policymakers and corporations in a complex globalized world. We're also honored to have him as an honorary member of our foundation's board of advisors. Mr. President, a huge thank you for hosting this webinar in your backyard. I also want to introduce Ms. Anait Avanesian, first Deputy Minister of Health in Armenia. Uh, after serving as a Deputy Minister of Health for the past two years, recently, congratulations, uh, Ms. Avanesian was appointed as the first Deputy Minister of Health. Also with us at the presidential backyard is the Professor, is Professor Vartui Petrosian. Welcome. Dean of Turpangian School of Public Health, American University. Dr. Petrosian also directs the Avedisian Onanian Center for Health Service Research and Development. She has successfully led health service research projects in Armenia and the region, focusing on public health services, tobacco control, tuberculosis, primary care, diabetics care, environmental health, and other important topics. Now I want to move to Germany. Professor Karl Lotterbach, uh, professor for health economics and Cl clinical epidemiology, University of Cologne, and also a member and the health expert of the Social Democratic Party at the German Bundestag. Since 1990, 1996, he has been a guest lecturer at the Harvard School of Public Health in Boston. From 1999 to 2005, he was a member of the German Council of Economic Experts and holds his mandate in the German Bundestag since 2005, where he became deputy parliamentary, parliamentary party leader of SPD since 2013. <laughs> Uh, shifting continents, going to Asia, Japan, Mr. Tomoshika Uyama, Director General, Office for Coronavirus Disease <coughs> Preparedness and Response, that the Cabinet Secretary of the Government of Japan. Mr. Uyama began his, uh, his career with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan in 1986 and has been involved in diplomatic services for the past 30 years. Also in Japan, we have Professor Hitoshi Oshitani. Welcome. Professor, Department of Virology, Tohoku University, Graduate School of Medicine, and member of Government Advisory Panel of COVID-19. Mr. Oshitani is a member of COVID-19 uh, Advisory Committee on Basic Action Policies and member of the COVID-19 Cluster Response Task Force at the Ministry of Health, Health, Labor, and Welfare in Japan. From 1999 to 2006, he served as an Infectious Disease Control Advisor at the World Health Organization Regional Office for Western Pacific in Manila, the Philippines. Coming back to Europe, Lord Daradarzi, welcome. Director of the Institute of Global Health Innovation at the Imperial College in London, also a member of our foundation's board of advisors. Uh, Lord Darzi is a, is a very special person. Lord Darzi, great to have you with us. Uh, Lord Darcy holds the Paul Hamblin Chair of Surgery at Imperial College London, an Institute of Cancer Research, and is the Executive Chair of the World Innovation Summit for Health in Qatar. 
Professor Darze leads a large multidisciplinary team across a diverse portfolio of academic and policy research. He has published over 1,000 peer-reviewed research papers to date, developing his status as a leading voice in the field of global health policy and innovation. In 2002, he was knighted for his services in medicine and surgery. In 2007, he was introduced to the United Kingdom's House of Lords as Professor Lord Darcy of Denham and appointed Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Department of Health. Professor Darcy was appointed and remains a member of Her Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council since 2009. Now moving to East Coast United States where it's very early in the morning. Dr. Nubara Feyan, co-founder and chairman of Moderna Therapeutics, as well as the founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering and FAST co-founder and a member of our board of trustees. Dr. Afeyan is a life science innovator, entrepreneur, and executive with more than three decades of experience creating and growing new ventures. In 2000, he founded Flagship Pioneering, a unique institution dedicated to systematically inventing and developing the next generation of life science companies. One of his portfolio companies, most people know in the world now, Moderna is one of the leading biotechnology companies that is developing experimental vaccines against the coronavirus. The company recently announced the progress on late stage development of mRNA-1273, the company's mRNA vaccine candidate against COVID-19. But beyond his work in life sciences, Dr. Afeyan is deeply involved in philanthropic efforts, particularly those related to the development of Armenia and the Armenian identity throughout the globe. Oh, I hope I did a good job. It's never easy to introduce so many um, uniquely accomplished individuals. And I could use an easy an hour introducing all of you. So uh, welcome everyone from so many different continents um, coming to um, homeland Armenia into the president's backyard. I want to I want to get right into business and I want to invite the president to speak a little bit about the current affairs in, in Armenia. Mr. President, we have over 9 million people around the world infected with nearly half a million disease, uh, uh, about 9 million around the world infected with nearly half a million disease. In Armenia, we have nearly 20 uh, infected with 386 fatalities. Uh, the daily case studies trend upward in many countries, making it difficult to predict where the world can take, uh, when the world can take a breather. If, if you can spend a couple of minutes just describing what the state of affairs is in Armenia and the globe as well. And the globe as well. Oh. Well, thank you very much for introduction. I'm very happy to host all of you, at least virtually in the backyard of presidential office or the palace. Uh, I would uh, ask Lord Darzi to allow me to take off my, <laughs> my mask because I'm sitting four meters from my colleagues outside and there's a nice, nice uh, wind here. Can I? Hello? Yes, Mr. President, yes, you can. Uh, actual fact, it doesn't work outside. You don't, and none of you need to have it on. Okay, thank you very much. I take this uh, as granted, and basically what we are doing at the presidential office, we have stopped our meetings inside, and I'm using this wonderful weather in Armenia in order to, to host, if I have to meet guests, which are not very, very many, uh, I, I'm them hosting them here outside, and that makes everybody safer, and it's nice. And I'm, I'm so sorry that I don't know uh, what is the weather in, in your countries, but this is a wonderful weather and nice and warm, but dry. So I hope the coronavirus will disappear one day, and I'll host all of you again here in Armenia. Now, what, what's happening uh, worldwide and in Armenia? Now, let me start with Armenia. Of course, it's it's tragic that we have, we have already around 400 dead, if I'm not mistaken. And this is growing every day, not in, in single uh, numbers, but in 10 or uh, between 10 and 20, which is very tragic. We are testing probably, if I'm not mistaken, up to 2,000 a day. And we're getting something one third, more or less one third affected. So if we test more, I don't know because that statistic is, uh, statistics is not linear, but in any case, it looks like we're still on, on the rise, so we're not on this curve. We're not at the top, so this uh, 
type of a curve, it could be Gaussian or any, uh, that we, are not, we have not reached that. Somehow we are late. Usually we are a nation that does everything earlier than others, like becoming the first Christian state in the world. But in the coronavirus, we are, we are a bit late and we are still growing. And that makes the whole situation quite, quite, quite dramatic. And we had recently, uh, we have uh, recently uh, much more energy put into the process fighting coronavirus, starting from this office where we had meetings with the minister here and former ministers and colleagues and boosting the whole idea that we have to get also international support. It's very important, both in kind and getting from different countries, which uh, our colleagues and my colleagues have responded very uh, swiftly, but also in, in a form of visits of doctors, but most, most important, if exchange in this world, you don't need to have a, an expert like Lord Darcy or, or each of you being present here, but we can have your advice virtually, and that's very, very important. Uh, in the case of the world, the one thing that I, I, I see is that the, we are going through very uh, dramatic and tragic times worldwide as well, but uh, I have said this several times on different video conferences recently because somehow this has opened doors for video conferencing worldwide. The last one, my mind last one was with India, organized by, by Horasis and uh, hundreds of thousands of people watching from India. But the whole idea is that this is, I think this is not because of the coronavirus. The world has changed. And the behavior of viruses, pandemics have changed dramatically. And we have to look forward to the future, realizing that this probably is not the last coronavirus, or the, not the, the, the last pandemic. We have to be ready. And definitely, worldwide, we have to invest more money into healthcare, more money into biology. And those who are doing bio research, like Mr. Rafayan and others. So somehow it's good news to realize that this world has changed. And our behavior is this, uh, in this new world has to change as well. So we have to redesign every and each sector and every and each step that we are following. Starting from our relations with the nature, we have to redefine. And there are many thoughts that whatever is happening today is also the result of our misbehavior with the nature or our whatever is the nature all around us. The way we run business tomorrow is going to change because there'll be new priorities worldwide. The way we run sectors of business like tourism and research and others will dramatically change. So we have to be ready and it's a crossroad to start rethinking. Every nation has to rethink what is going to happen after coronavirus. Some, as I said, it's a crossroad and it's a crossroad for Armenia. So we have to redefine what are our priorities. It's obviously there are some priorities that we need immediately because if we want to sell goods in to the world, we have to rethink of advertising new Armenia again. So we need tools like a trade agency or a foreign investment agency that will basically try to explain to any foreign investor that why invest in Armenia in the world, in the new world of after coronavirus and help our businesses to sell their goods abroad. Secondly, definitely, e-government becomes a necessity everywhere. In this building, which is the presidential palace, it becomes a necessity also in the whole Republic of Armenia. E-education, e-health becomes a necessity because one of the things that we have learned that we need to be connected to the world. And in many cases, all the different departments of our healthcare, uh, they have to have full a full, and it's a small country, small country that in order to have full data on every and each citizen, health data of 3 million people, it's not a problem. It's a wonderful medium-sized project that could be achieved the way I see as a specialist of, of IT in a year time. And then we have to think about other sectors as well, like food security, because worldwide there'll be further difficulties in economy but the next also big difficulty is coming to every country, including to those countries that you live, be that the United States, Japan, or indeed Britain, food security. None of your countries uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, sorry, none of them are, are, 
have the full supply of food for long term internally. They all trade, including Britain, Lord Darcy. I think I looked at, at the scale of, of food supplies to UK, except two or three items or majority of the food, uh, food comes from outside. So every country will face food security when the logistics is very sensitive, when the usual contact and relations or, 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 or uh, job distribution is, is, is damaged. So Armenia specifically has to face that because we're a landlocked country of, with four neighbors out of four, two, we don't have any relations. So food security for Armenia is a very sensitive issue. So we have to think about fighting coronavirus today. We have to think short term about the economic difficulties that we're going to, to face tomorrow. And we have to think about food security issues that are, are going to be with us all of this month and maybe another several years. And then plan also long term restarting several sectors of our economy. So there's a lot to, to discuss. There's a lot to work. It's tragic time, but it's also a time that everybody will have a chance to restart properly. If you are smart, you do your decisions, you have a proper vision and a program, then this is an opportunity, opportunity to restart, but restart well. To restart doing better than you were doing before and probably, hopefully, to restart better than some of your competitors or friends are doing. So that's my simple message to to not probably to you, to our audience, that it's a, it's a challenging time. We are going to live in a new world. Many things will be revalued, and we have to learn again how to live in this world. And if we are smart, then we'll be successful. If we are not, then God help us, everybody. Mr. President, thank you so much. A restart is one of the key things that we need to be concerned about. And with that, I wanted to come to you Ms. Uh, Avanesian, at the Minister of Health, um, before we restart, we need to figure out where we are in this, in this space. Can you tell us a little bit of what the state of affairs is in Armenia? As, as we all know, uh, the whole system of healthcare uh, and the concept of healthcare and the role of healthcare in the society has been redefined and people understood that healthcare is one of the um, most important key elements of national security. So uh, Armenian healthcare system was uh, uh, under financed many, many years. And of course we have uh, lots of um, gaps and uh, needs to be met in a new reality uh, and uh, to make uh, the whole system to, more, to work more efficiently. But I can say that having this system, uh, which we inherited from Soviet times and we had very dramatic changes during this uh, last 20 years, we can say that uh, for these very challenging times, they are doing a very good job and our medical staff uh, we have uh, five, uh, five uh, teams, medical teams arrived from different countries and we have their opinions that really uh, the system, of course, had need to be uh, uh, done many reforms, but uh, in overall, it is doing a very good job. And then I, I want to come to you, Dr. Petrosian. Uh, let's see if we can if we can put up those slides. Are we uh, from this point that minister was saying that about that uh, Armenian healthcare was underfinanced? So I think, in my opinion, it's the time that the government and the Ministry of Health will really think is the best time for the Ministry of Health to come to, to go to the Parliament and sort of a double their budget. Because everybody will understand now is the time that we have to spend more time and more money and more effort in the healthcare. In six months time, 10 months time, a year, I know our human right, behavior. Right, we will right. forget all of it, but you going asking not double it, but just adding another 10% will be much more harder than double it today. So it's a time that we not only rethink, but redo right. our healthcare. That's why. Dude. On that note, uh, can we put up the slides?
So let's 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 move to um, to the first slide here. All right. So I wanted I wanted uh, for our audience to see um, some of the comparisons where Armenia is uh, when it comes to reg uh, when it comes to um, the region, its standing, its state of affairs when it comes to the region. So there's some uh, very interesting steps. I, I'm, I'm hoping, Dr. Petrosian, you can see this is a little bit distance from uh, from us. Uh, for uh, for those of you who are not here, you know, it's like you can see it well, but it's it's distant away uh, from us. Let's let's go to the next slide. Yeah, wanted uh, we also wanted to uh, present to our audience that are not familiar. Uh, with, state of affairs in Armenia as to uh, what the daily new cases are in Armenia. As you see, there was uh, really a, a major increase a couple of weeks ago, uh, but it, it seems like it could have been the peak. Now it's tapering off, somewhat tapering off, and we're hoping uh, that will remain the same, if not go down. Um, and then here, um, even if we wanted to see, we wanted to display where the peak is um, again, uh, where Armenia compares uh, with the rest of the world, and you will see we're we're going from all continents to see where uh, how Armenia compares to the rest of the world, and then we wanted to come back to the region and and display besides Armenia, has the region passed the peak? And you see some of the countries here, we have Turkey and Georgia, it seems like uh, both of this nation, uh, the, the worst is behind uh, both of these nations. And then when we show Iran and Azerbaijan with Iran, is, is not very clear, you know, there was, there was some progress, but it seems like it's picking up again. In Azerbaijan, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still on, on the rise. And then uh, since we have our colleagues from USA and, and UK, we wanted to show our audience, but also to our uh, distinguished panelists, what it looks like in, in their countries. Uh, in USA, it seems like um, there's some kind of a plateau, although it's very high, but it, it could, be, uh, could be, although some states are still climbing up uh, overall in the United States, it, it, it appears that uh, we're reaching a plateau. Uh, UK is doing far better than how it started um, earlier in the year. And then we have uh, two uh, very positive cases in Germany and Japan. Uh, the worst is really uh, behind Germany. And we would like to hear from our German uh, colleague at, uh, in, in a minute or two um, to, to give us some of, the, some of the perspective of how they've gotten to, to where they are in Germany and then Japan. It, it, they're doing significantly well than um, only about a month, month and a half ago. So I, 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 I want to come to you, uh, Dr. Petrosian, you know, knowing w where Armenia stands and what's, what's happening and, you know, uh, what's happening with the rest of the world and how our uh, deputy minister was saying healthcare system was underfunded. There was a lot of things that was difficult uh, for us to obtain to deal with the crisis. And the president were saying we need a restart. What do we need to do first for us to get to that restart and, you know, to, to match some of the successes that happened in the world, but also for Armenia to get ahead? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ozian. Uh, I would like to say a couple of things. Uh, when we look at countries and their performance, it's very important to consider that this is a very complex issue. It's very multifactorial, and the performance of health system is also multifactorial. And local context is very important. We have to look at the financial resources, human resources, infrastructure resources available to those countries. For example, if expanded testing might be the best decision in a very high income country, that might not be feasible for a lower income country such as Armenia. So, and also there are other things to consider. What are the local customs? What is the family structure in every country? For example, in Armenia, we have families, multi-generational families living together. So this adds additional complexity uh, to the situation and also the list of solutions that we need to think about. 
uh, and but I, I don't want to sound very pessimistic as I see opportunity in every adversity, as my colleagues have already mentioned beautifully. Uh, but one thing that we have been saying, health providers, public health specialists were emphasizing that universal health coverage is very important. It's a basic human right. But nowadays, I'm happy to see that the entire society and all the sectors are also seeing what we have been seeing for many years. But that's not enough. Allocating resources will not resolve the situation if we don't think smartly about how we allocate those resources. For example, public health. It has been underfunded in every country, I can say, even in countries where they have tremendous amount of resources because people don't see the result of public health immediately. When you get a surgery, you see the result. But with public health efforts, it takes years to see the results. And sometimes from decision makers, politicians, we need real courage to allocate the needed resources to public health. But now, as uh, President Sarkisian mentioned, our policymakers, decision makers, they see the arguments for allocating more to public health and I also want to emphasize risk communication in these days and also community engagement. We can come up with best solutions on paper, but we need to find a way to communicate that to the society. And we're seeing that uh, when we started major efforts for community engagement, people started believing into what we were preaching that we have to follow the public health measures. But in every country, this is a very challenging situation and we need to stay alert, uh, ready for flexibility, <clears throat> changing our decisions as we get more information from science. Thank you. We, we're talking about, we wanna have a restart, restart. We know that the healthcare system is underfunded and it's not unique to Armenia. Although I, you know, the country that I come from, United States, is I think it's overly funded. It's just incorrectly funded, but that's another topic for another day. Um, we're looking into family structures. Lord Darcy, I, I want to come to you with a different type of a question. You know, when when it comes to dealing with uh, COVID-19, there is really not no clarity as to what success means. Does success mean complete elimination? but this is too tall of a task. Is it really possible to have complete elimination? Or is it some sort of a continuum when you have it contained? Or you know, how, how are you looking at this? Or how should we look at this when we're saying we are successful in dealing with this pandemic? Thank you. And thank you very much for having me on this panel. And uh, uh, lovely to see your excellency, president and colleagues from the ministry. It's a difficult uh, question. I mean, the success would eventually comes when, you know, there is a discovery that will beat this virus, and I'm sure you will come to that later. Uh, the way we're looking at this, this is gonna be with us for a long time. Uh, we're certainly, even with the wonderful opportunities out there in vaccine developments, we are in many ways engaging the public that we're gonna be living with COVID for the foreseeable future. And the way in which you could success in living with the virus will translate into how do we reduce the burden of COVID-19 in society? How could we firstly reduce the tragic deaths and fatalities? Uh, and then the secondly, uh, how do we actually in fact control or manage the infection out in the community? which I will come back to. And the third point is, uh, is we need a significant mindset change. You very eloquently described the peaks earlier in different countries. Uh, we should never lose the opportunity from learning what we've learned through these peaks. So the first thing in terms of uh, keeping the, uh, the actual infection rates uh, low the only way you're gonna achieve that is by a successful testing and a tracing program. Uh, and by achieving that, then you will obviously chase the virus 
in the community. In the first peak, and I'm sure it's no different in any country, the virus was chasing us in the hospitals, so in the intensive care units. So patients were coming in significantly ill, requiring ventilation. The mindset change has been, we need to chase the virus out in the community, not in the hospitals. And to do that, you have to have absolutely superb testing system with a huge capacity that you can turn around the testing and the results, may I just say, within few hours of testing an individual. Then with that testing is obviously the tracing and some countries have adopted the technology route, which is the, uh, which is the tracing app. We've had a controversy in the UK on that because we went for the centralization of the data, which created some technical issues for us rather than looking at the decentralized way, uh, which actually in fact, uh, any individual who's been in contact with you will get an alert. Uh, and obviously the tracing will also increase the capacity that you need for a proper testing program. The second, uh, what we've learned is in testing, which is what Germany has done, you need a much more devolved structure. If you're trying to run this centrally in a big country with 63 million people, it's a fairly challenging thing to do. So use your local council at a, at a council level to see how you can actually in fact run your testing and tracing program. Uh, beside chasing the virus and testing, you also need to have at a national level what we call a, an epidemiological studies to identify and at least calculate your, what we call the reproduction rate, the R value. And our aim to be successful is to keep the R value below one. Uh, not an easy task to do. And we also need to appreciate as we just coming out of the lockdown is that we need to make sure that we have the R value at a much more granular level. So we have two national screening programs. One is the Office of National Statistics, which are following 20,000 households. They're getting daily, a weekly testing done. Uh, and the second study, which uh, I have the privilege of leading with some very distinguished scientists is REACT-1, which is essentially testing every two weeks. We send 150,000 tests randomly in 315 local councils. In England, we have 350 local councils. These tests will arrive in the post. Uh, population is selected and adjusted for age, sex, and ethnicity. The test is done, the package is collected, and these are random testing because that is the only way we can calculate the R value. And thankfully, the R value at the moment is anywhere between 0.7 to about 0.9. We like that to be significantly lower than that. Because if the R value is above one, every person is going to infect two, every two is going to infect four, every four is going to infect eight. So it's, it's completely out of control. And the other beauty about doing this uh, testing at a national level, at a more granular level, is that we cannot, UK cannot afford another lockdown. I don't think any country in the world could afford a, another lockdown. So strategically, we need to shift from a national lockdown to much more local lockdown. So if we identify at a granular level, where are the areas in which we have an R value greater than one, and then essentially we just hound on that and obviously manage the schools, the employment and closed facilities and intervene at that level. And I think the best example I'm sure would be talked about is what's happened in Germany with the abattoirs in which the R value just shot up and they just went straight down there in a very strategic uh, way of shutting the whole thing down. So that is what we're getting ourselves ready for. We believe over summer, we will have some breathing space to improve uh, some of these uh, initiatives. And at the same time, what we're also doing uh, as part of our program of sustainability or in, in the testing is obviously run through the antibody testing because we also need to know the seropositive prevalence in different parts of the country. And to our surprise, for example, we believe that the percentage zero, zero positive in London is about 17%. So we can actually address the economic aspect because you have to remember as you 
shut down. We've had a huge economic issues and we're just about to see how could we uh, switch on the economic engine and that switching on on the economic engine will depend obviously on the prevalence of how many of the population are, are zero positive. So, uh, so that's, these, are, these are the interventions that we're doing. And I think successes also depend as having, I think the biggest challenge in COVID, uh, if you're a policymaker or, or in office, is the communication with the public. If you don't get that right, there is an issue of mistrust that will develop. And we, in some cases, we did have the communications, uh, not necessarily what I will describe as excellent, uh, and I think the communications certainly have improved in the last couple of weeks in terms of uh, how do you uh, really essentially ease the lockdown. And also the other thing we've learned is in actual fact, doing a lockdown is much, much easier than undoing the lockdown. So how do you stage these is a very, very critical one. And ultimately, I'll come back to the point is there is also success with me measured if you like, how do you get the balance right between lives and livelihoods? Uh, the last thing you want to end up is an economic catastrophe. And let's not forget, uh, if you have any, uh, your history will always tell you that during an economic downturn, in actual fact, the mortality uh, figures increase, the physical and mental health of your population is significantly deteriorated. So that is the judgment call that most policy and political leaders have to make, which is not an easy one. And I sympathize to anyone is in that position. Uh, and that is, that is the one that we continue to uh, debate. But you have to debate that with a clear communication line and winning the hearts and minds and the trust of the population that you're serving. I think the point about communication is, is so critical and so crucial. And I'm afraid that most governments and most people made a mistake early on and continue making a mistake in some of some mistakes, some of the cases. It's just uh, in most places we're running after the pandemic. We haven't figured out how to deal with this. You're learning on the go and you miscommunicate. And then once you miscommunicate once, it's very difficult to come back and build that trust back with your public. Um, you mentioned one thing about you know, lockdowns and lives and livelihoods. Um, if we're going to live with this, as you pointed out, I, I wanna go to uh, Germany. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the statistics uh, for, for Germany uh, compared to UK, uh, where it's per million, we have 628 deaths. Italy 573, Spain 606, and France nearly 500. Germany had the lowest, about 100, 107. Um, uh, Professor Loderbach, uh, what's that? What's the uniqueness? Is is you know? Did you have um, different types of mechanisms already in place for you to deal with this? Because it was surprising, as the pandemic was really swiftly overtaking Western Europe. Uh, Germany, at least in this domain, was in a way immune. If, if you will share some of your uh, thoughts uh, about this, thank you. Well, thank you first uh, for having me on this important panel. Um, my Excellency, Mr. President, my esteemed colleagues, I'm very honored to share a couple of thoughts with you and I will try to explain first what went well in Germany, but I would also like to point out uh, what did not go so well. Let me start off. Germany has been lucky. Uh, I, it is not to be underestimated that we were hit in the first wave of, of the pandemic at a time when unfortunately from the perspective of other European countries, in particular Italy and Spain, other countries were hit already to a much larger degree. So we saw the, um, the horrible videos and the horrible pictures from Italy, a country which we Germans like and love and know very well. So the population, it was immediately aware of the fact that this is a very dangerous uh, disease and uh, was prepared basically 
to go along with our recommendations. Uh, number two, and I think this was very important, we in Berlin immediately um, decided on a strategy which was basically a strategy uh, which I would call science-based. So we had a team of scientists that was advising us, epidemiologists, virologists, clinicians. I was part of that team. And we agreed basically on what was to do and would uh, negotiate this with uh, the ministers uh, in the cabinet and Chancellor Merkel. And we basically agreed that we would all stand for the same position. So as a matter of fact, we would be open about the position we decided to defend, but then defend it in common. And even the opposition went along and would not try to take political advantage of a crisis like this, a crisis which threatens the health, but also the unity of the nation. So there was, uh, among all parties and among all political leaders, an agreement that we would go about this in a science-based, evidence-based manner, and we would not, let's say, struggle, we would not fight about minor differences, but defend the commonality. Number three, I think our initial lockdown was also fairly efficient. We came up with a, an immediate lockdown with closing all schools and universities, uh, prohibiting all bigger public gatherings, and also closing down all non-essential non business, as a matter of fact, including bars, restaurants, fitness clubs, you name it. So there was economy is still available, it was going on. There was, let's say, whatever was needed in order to sustain the population in terms of, let's say, healthcare, in terms of, let's say, nutrition, food, public transport, but everything was limited to the degree uh, that was necessary and no unnecessary risks were taken. That was well accepted by the population, but we also immediately supported the population financially, because if you want people to stay home, stay inside, and if you want people to follow the orders that are expensive because they cannot earn a living, then you have to provide money for them. So we came up with a support system that gave money to solo business people, to let's say unemployed or underemployed people, and made sure that no one was in the necessity to go to work for financial reasons. We uh, came up with, let's say, a rescue package, which made sure that everyone would be able to, uh, let's say, get by in terms of living costs. And we also made sure that no one was permitted to be pushed out of the workforce or pushed out of his home or her home so there was, let's say, a ban on ending contracts where people live. There was, let's say, an agreement between employers and employees and unions and politicians that we would not, uh, let's say, fire people in such a crisis, but stand in this one together. So that was basically, these were the three pillars of the response. Response pillar number one, we were lucky time-wise the population was prepared. Pillar number two, the lockdown was very efficient, was science-based, was clearly articulated, and we would typically appear in the public, politicians and scientists together, so that it was clear that the politicians were relying on the scientists and we would allow the scientists to explain to the public what the response was and pillar number three major financial support for everyone so that no one was in a necessity to work go to work or take risks for financial reasons that was basically the response we mounted and um, we gradually faded out from that step by step and we decided that we would now let respond on a local level with local lockdowns. So when we eased the lockdowns, we basically came up with a policy which I would call local lockdown policy, a policy which, let's say, uh, monitors all municipalities in Germany 
a typical municipality in Germany is about 100,000 inhabitants. And if there is more than 50 new cases in one week in a municipality, then this municipality goes into immediate lockdown. That strategy is in place with a massive testing uh, strategy. We, do, we are capable of doing between 1 million and 2 million tests per week. Currently, we are running half of this because we have low numbers of infection rates, but we have closed one municipality because of a local meat uh, production um, local pandemic. But other than that, our numbers are currently in control. The R value is monitored on a national level. The current R value is again higher than one, but this is only because we had that local outbreak, which we are controlling with the local lockdown. And we are preparing for a possible second wave in the fall. I should, want, I should point out that Lord Darcy, esteemed colleague, uh, um, explained it very well when he said, the success of such a response depends on how well you can communicate what you are doing, how well people can follow and accept what the strategy is. Then you will carry the message and people will follow the message. If there is mixed messages and it is, if what you are doing is not, let's say, um, science-based, if there is contradictions in what you are doing, then the population not always able to express these doubts, nevertheless, feels the insecurities and the inconsistencies and will not go along. So therefore, uh, I fully agree with lo what Lord Darcy so eloquently uh, pointed out to all of us. We have to have a clear strategy, well communicated without inconsistencies, and you have to basically be responsive to new scientific evidence. Uh, so therefore we monitor the new studies on a daily basis. We, for example, take into consideration in our strategy, our response strategy, the em enormous uh, importance of super spreaders of the K, so-called dispersion factor. We take into consideration the possible aerosol uh, contamination uh, and uh, let's say indoor uh, transmission of the virus is about 15 to 20 times as likely as outdoor contamination. So we try to be responsive to new science whenever it comes up and we are waiting uh, for, uh, for uh, let's say medical science to come up with a vaccine because we believe that this will not be over in Germany before we have a vaccine we do not believe in and we do not follow the goal of herd immunity. We do not believe in that at all. We try to keep the number of infected people as low as possible. Also because we know that many of those who do not die from COVID-19 sustain major disability as a consequence of it. And this is also we, uh, something we keep in mind and try to monitor as as good as we can. Great um, points that you're making about Germany. I think, you know, you mentioned three things there, the three paths. Uh, one was, um, you said one was that, you know, we were, you were lucky. I think that's not something that we can model in other places, so that's luck. We're going to leave that up. But the second point was science-based. And I think as your chancellor, we have our president here who's also a scientist. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna piggyback on that science component there. And I wanna go to our colleague to United States. Um, you know, everyone has mentioned that we gotta live with this. And you just, you just also spoke about that not until there is a vaccine, uh, we, we cannot relax. We, we have to be always alert and we need to figure this out. We need to come back, you know, there is no herd immunity that you believe in or you, you, you don't want to expose your, your people um, uh, to, to that type of a reality. Uh, Dr. Afeyan, uh, uh, one of your portfolio companies, Moderna, is, uh, has been in the news for the last uh, three months since, since the pandemic has, has started. 
and I know you are in later phases of, of uh, trials and testing, uh, please uh, let us uh, talk to us about, since we're going to have to live with this, um, are we ever going to be COVID free? Um, How is science integrated into this? Uh, well, good, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me as well. <clears throat> well, the, the topic you, you've asked me about is something that uh, every television channel is covering 24 hours a day. So I'm afraid that you know as much as I do about these things just because of the, the coverage. Um, they, uh, maybe I'll take a slightly different, I'll make a slightly different point as well about that in a second. Um, as, as hopefully everybody knows, there is a fairly broad-based uh, attempt to apply multiple different technologies towards producing a vaccine. Traditional technologies like making protein subunits uh, are being pursued. Those will go slower, uh, but, but they will. They certainly there's no reason to believe you can't have an effective vaccine. Attenuated virus vaccines are being tried. Some are beginning to be in the clinic. Those also have a lot of precedence. Um, and, but they have to be tried from a point of view of safety uh, as well. And then there's a couple of new approaches. One is a viral vector and the other one is messenger RNA, which is the last one being what we have been pioneering. And there's multiple other companies now having entered that as well. In fact, two of them in Germany. Um, you know, what we believe given all of these different approaches and given that everybody understands the consequences of, of, of both the positive and negative execution that everybody is very much focused on doing uh, significant attempts to ensure safety, to demonstrate across enough people the potential efficacy. And I think by the way that there's been a, a general um, kind of debate out there about how reckless uh, going fast might be uh, as though uh, you, you have going fast means cutting corners. Uh, going fast could mean cutting corners, and then going fast could mean simply going fast based on technology, based on financial resources, etc. One of the reasons your audience should understand vaccines take forever to develop uh, is because people are not willing to invest in vaccines before knowing that they're going to work, which means that basically there's really no rush. There's never any real rush in the way a pandemic has created. So there's a circular argument that says, vaccines take forever, and that's because there was never anything that caused, at least in the recent past, uh, and nobody was willing to put up the money. Today, multiple governments and, and nonprofits have put up significant resources, as well as large companies, as well as ours, which is a medium-sized company. And so I think that contributes to being able to go fast, plus the technology has advanced. Um, where we are in this process is, is that, you know, I think that several approaches will be tried over the next few months. Uh, in advanced clinical trials, and I hope that before the end of this year, uh, there will be um, definitive evidence, if not enough evidence, and there's different standards uh, for people to begin to plan on how vaccines might be produced and distributed at large scale. This is a global challenge. There's a fairness of distribution issue. Uh, there's just a lot that, that's being done for the first time in such an intense way. And uh, we have, I have some visibility to it from our angle, but I could say maybe there's two things that I'll, I'll point out that may not be as clearly understood. One is everybody considers a, a vaccine as though it was kind of aspirin where, you know, everybody's aspirin is the same. Uh, but it turns out that vaccines are gonna potentially have very different effects on people. Different approaches will provide different levels of coverage and only the data that can be generated in human trials, and this is where the science comes in, will reveal actually the effectiveness of the various approaches. And I think that the kind of epidemiological models and the threat levels and the susceptibility of people uh, with, with comorbidities and age, et cetera, are going to determine what kind of coverage one needs uh, and, and which vaccines can deliver that. So beyond just safety, I think there's gonna have to be a lot learned over the next year or two years about the efficacy and the degree of protection of the different approaches being taken. But having said all of that, I see in the first kind of couple of quarters of next year, uh, potentially now regularly approved vaccines, meaning having gone through all the, all the rigorous testing that become available 
at, at substantial quantities, by then I mean hundreds of millions of doses, and hopefully eventually billions of doses. The more vaccines get approved, the better, as far as I'm concerned, because the, 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 the market base for this is basically the whole planet. Uh, I agree with the colleagues from Germany that, that the notion that we can vaccinate a few people and then hope the rest just kind of safely get it and, and, and wash away is not uh, realistic. You asked what might happen even afterwards. I think the best current thinking is that this is not a virus that's yet going to be viewed as seasonal, but it's not clear that one administration of vaccine, even with two shots, is going to prevent uh, um, the, the virus affecting individual humans beyond one year, two years, three years. It's unknowable, but very few people believe that you're going to achieve lifetime immunity based on the current approaches. So I think we do have to think about approaches that can be administered uh, on, an, on a time occasional uh, basis. We'll see how, how frequent or infrequent that can be. Uh, but I think all of that said, vaccines are historically a fairly powerful and cost-effective way to deal with this kind of a pathogen threat. And, and we're, everybody working in this is piggybacking off of you know, decades and decades of, of learnings. And hopefully this will give us some additional learnings. I'll say one last thing, Armin, into this discussion we haven't really covered, which is, you know, all of us have expressed views. And this is another unprecedented time where science politics, economics are all you know, kind of merging into, into a discussion where it's very difficult to determine actually facts. And facts are, are, are at a premium because this is such a period of uncertainty and ambiguity that at some level, even people you may consider experts, and I'll include myself maybe in this regard, are actually largely speculating. And, and experts generally don't like speculating. They like asserting reality. But the reality is we don't know what reality is. And so experts are being made, in my experience, publicly uh, to speculate. Uh, and, 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 and I worry a little bit that the reason we're seeing such opposite views about every single topic is in fact a sign that we're in a turbulent period and the facts are hard to establish. When things become a bit more predictable and, and non-turbulent, we can go back to being experts again. But I think all of us as experts, so-called experts in our fields should recognize and put a footnote that says, despite being experts, we actually aren't as certain about any of this as we were in what we knew a lot about which came before COVID. Just my, my attitude towards this, I'm, I'm quite concerned at the assertiveness of expert views being expressed all over the world as though they were certainties. Dr. and so we're expert speculators here, as, as you would put it. And I, I, wanna, I wanna take that speculation and take it all the way to Japan now and invite our colleagues um, to, you know, you mentioned something, uh, Dr. Feyan, which was, uh, we may never have immunity for this, right, from this. So in, in uh, our colleagues in Japan, how are you viewing, uh, how are you viewing dealing with, with the virus moving forward? You know, there's socioeconomic elements uh, that Lord Darcy mentioned. And then, you know, we have on the other side of uh, the spectrum, we're talking about scientific, uh, scientific elements that we need to uh, look at and, um, and integrate into our thinking, into our policy making. Uh, if you can elaborate a little bit on to what's taking place in Japan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good, e good evening and good morning. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Uyama Tomochika, Director General at the Office for COVID-19 Preparedness and Response, uh, Cabinet Secretariat. I'm from the government and the, uh, we have also the uh, science scientists uh, uh, to, to be followed and the, uh, to try to have some uh, view for both sides. And the, uh, by the way, I really appreciate this opportunity and particularly His Excellency President uh, as a son of Armenia and the organizers and my colleagues for having such an important event today. <clears throat> Never been to Armenia myself, but I hope to visit your beautiful place. Uh, it looks very beautiful today. Thank you. As my uh, part of my work, I often attend the uh, press conference, unfortunately, <laughs> in Japan. And one of the questions I received from an international media was, um, 
what is the reason why the number of deaths due to COVID-19 in Japan is so low compared with other developed countries? The Japanese approach to COVID-19 was quite different from many other countries. While many other countries experienced strict lockdown, the Japanese government uh, asked voluntary restraint. Japan is well known as super aging society. Tokyo and Osaka areas are well known as density of population and packed commuter trains. So many thought Tokyo is going to be like New York and the hospitals in Japan will be overwhelmed. People are afraid that there uh, would be so many cases and so many deaths. Actually, the results was different. And while Japan did not so good as our neighbors like Taiwan, we did suppress the deaths to a minimum, as Mr. Chad Ross, the Director General of WHO stated. I strongly felt that I should do my best to facilitate the exchange of experiences of different countries, including those of Japan, for a future endeavor, in particular in our preparation efforts for a possible next wave. The essence of our message was that we should know the peculiar characteristic of the virus and we should have a right strategy to tackle it. Uh, through our early experience, the Japanese experts found that the COVID-19 virus transmits mainly through clusters or super spreading events. So if such clusters were, to, were found and contained, the virus, con uh, virus transmission will not be sustainable. Our experts also found the conditions where many clusters were created. They are closed space, crowded places, and close contact setting especially involving loud talking or talking in close proximity to others. So there are three C's. So we call them three C's, actually in Japanese, sammitsu. In other words, if people can effectively avoid such three C's, we'll be able to prevent clusters, leading to slowing down the transmission of the virus. The advisory committee of the Japanese government, a group of experts is headed by Mr. Omi, uh, who is a former WHO regional director of the Western Pacific region. And the, another uh, expert, Dr. Oshitani, who is with us today, is also a famous uh, expert and the member of the advisory committee, also uh, has so many experiences in WHO, including in addressing SARS in the past. For the early days, the Japanese government, including Prime Minister, uh, from, sorry, from the early days, the Japanese government, including Prime Minister and uh, our Minister Nishimura, attached great importance to the device of the experts. So uh, we have a very close contact with experts and the politicians uh, make instructions uh, uh, based on such advice. So what I'd like to express is that Japanese policy is strictly science-driven, strictly experts-driven. So um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, uh, Oshitani Sensei uh, to uh, make a presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, the, for inviting us for this uh, important panel. Uh, Your Excellencies, it's our great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, or the, the, to share our experience with you. The, as the Lord Darji mentioned, uh, many countries are using uh, testing and uh, tracing uh, the strategy. But uh, as Mr. Wierma mentioned, we are using a quite different uh, approach. And uh, from the beginning, the, the main objective of our the response to COVID-19 is uh, the, to minimize the, the social and economic impact while the minimizing the, the impact of this virus on health. And uh, the, so far, the, we are more or less the, been successful the, in reducing the number of cases and the deaths. And uh, let me the, use uh, some PowerPoint uh, to explain what we had, we've been doing. Can you see our slide? Yes. So, as Mr. Wierma mentioned, we are using a quite different approach from other countries. The, actually, the, this COVID-19, the, 
the most of infected individuals that do not pass the virus to others, the only about the, the tw less than 20% that pass the virus to others, and uh, only very small proportion of uh, the infected individual infect many others, and uh, which create the, 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 we call it as a cluster or the super spreading event. And uh, without super spreading event or the large clusters, the, the transmission chain cannot be sustained. So the, from the beginning, the, our strategy the, uh, have been focusing on the, how to deal with uh, the, these clusters. And uh, to find many clusters, the, we are using the, the quite a different the strategy to identify cases. The, our PCR testing, the number of testing is the, has been quite limited, but uh, we are using the PCR testing the strategically. And uh, the, when we find some cases, the, instead of doing uh, so-called prospective contact tracing, the, I understand that many countries are just doing uh, the prospective contact tracing. The, the meaning that uh, you trace the contact of the confirmed cases. The, we are also, also using this prospect contact tracing, but uh, the, our focus is more on retrospective contact tracing, the, which means that uh, the, we are trying to identify the source of infection. And uh, source of infection is the more likely to be a cluster or the large cluster. And by using the, this approach, the, we managed to identify many clusters. And uh, also we managed to the, the, uh, prevent the emergence of other clusters the, around, around the, the identified clusters. And also by analyzing many, many the clusters that we found the some, some common characteristics the among clusters. The, that is uh, the, the three C's, as uh, the Mr. Wiyama mentioned, the close environment, the crowded environment, and the close contact environment. And uh, so in Japan, the, we call it as a Samitsu, and uh, actually the most of people in Japan, even small kids, uh, know about this uh, the notion. And uh, we managed to uh, send to the general public to avoid such the risky environment. The, we believe that, uh, that this is uh, the one with the key element for the success the, in the Japanese the, the response. And uh, this is the uh, epidemiology of COVID-19 so far. The, the, we called the, the, the outbreak from January to mid-March as a first wave, the, which was originated from the imported cases uh, from China. And uh, the, for our second wave, the starting around the mid-March, the the, was caused by the many, many imported cases the, from Europe, the Southeast Asia, North America, and so on. And, uh, but uh, the, our outbreak was peaked around the early the April. And uh, the, the, the Prime Minister declared a state of emergency the, on 7th of April. And uh, the state, state of emergency was lifted the, on 25th of uh, the, the May. And uh, almost one month has passed the, after the lifting the, the state of emergency. And uh, we are still seeing the, some sporadic cases. And the number of cases uh, is a bit increased. And, uh, but uh, we were expecting uh, this kind of uh, the smaller the outbreaks. And uh, now we are trying to use the new technologies uh, to minimize the impact the, during the second wave. The, unfortunately, we had many the outbreaks in hospital settings and the nursing home uh, type of settings. And uh, the, that's why the, we had the, the many 
the severe cases and the deaths, but uh, we managed to uh, limit the number of the deaths and uh, our number of deaths uh, so far is less than 1,000. And uh, the, the, I'm sure the, the circulation of this virus will continue and uh, elimination or eradication or the containment of the, this virus is not feasible option in uh, the, the near future. So without uh, effective vaccine. And uh, we have to live with this virus for some time. And uh, we are trying to use the best, uh, we are trying to find the best way to uh, live with this virus the, while minimizing the impact of this virus. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's uh, um, the three C's, I think, I think we ought to remember those as well. And I think going back to what our deputy minister was saying um, earlier and our colleague, uh, Dr. Petrosian, culture also matters on how you're dealing with those three C's. It's, it's one thing knowing how, what needs to be done. It's another thing being able to execute it. For all of this, I think uh, international collaboration or collaboration of sort is, is very important. And I want to I wanna come back to you, Mr. President. You know, there's several, several ways, several ways to, uh, to this. This information exchange is critical, but also support between nations and maybe uh, very close collaboration, be it scientific or otherwise. Uh, Mr. President, you know, hearing all, all of this from our experts from around the world, uh, what would you add about collaboration uh, between nations and, and on the side of Armenia in particular? Well, thank you very much. I think it was quite fascinating to hear what our colleagues were saying. If I try to summarize what I heard, which was basically neither new nor sort of a, uh, uh, or, or something that I've not heard before, but it it's, it's proves that what I really believed or heard from other, other colleagues worldwide as well is, is more or less the same. And if I may summarize what I've learned and if uh, the colleagues will, will uh, correct me if I am wrong, I'll be very, very happy. What I've learned, if I take as an example, our German colleagues uh, presentation when he says the three pillars, the one was luck. Well, I, I'm sorry, I don't take that as, as luck because Everybody is, is equal under the, under the God. It's, it's about when you, there are many people that see the same thing, that, but they don't, they view the same thing, but they don't see. So luck in this case is about how, how sharp and how focused is the government, the institutions or others in order to see the danger coming earlier than others. So maybe you are lucky in a sense that there were cases before you, but you are not the only one there. So may, there were many others seeing that the, the viewing that the, that, that the danger was coming from China, but it's up to those, the successful ones were the ones who were, who were not lucky, but were smart enough or sharp enough to recognize that you have to act now. You don't wait until it comes and starts hurting. So this is not about luck. It is about to be vigilant and to be, to be ready for the challenges of this world. So it's always the case in the individual life. Some people say, ah, he was lucky because he was lucky businessman. Yeah, that lucky businessman was most probably was the sharpest, smartest and the quickest. And that was the case. And I take this as also a case for, for behavior of governments as well. The second issue was that about quick response and Lord Darza added here as well. If I try to summarize the key words that we heard here, the one thing is scientific approach. The moment it comes up, you have to, to leave all of the political approaches, economic approach, uh, approaches, and you have to go basically on scientific approach. So uh, every prime minister or president who is executive, everybody, wh whoever is running it has to have scientists, specialists near him, and to have, polit uh, to, have to scientific approach to, to the project or the problem. Then the second thing I think inside every each government or inside every each country, people have to agree, specifically politicians have to agree that this is a national disaster and you have to put aside all of your discussions about and valuation of uh, others' behavior to the future 
and you have to have a national unity in order to fight the, the disease. So basically, and everybody has to agree that there's only one truth and that truth is a scientific one. Then it comes another word which is important, which is discipline. I mean, discipline here, here, here matters. And maybe one of the successes in, in Japan or, or, or in Germany is that they're a bit more organized or a bit more disciplined than the others. Well, I'm, I'm not the judge here, but discipline matters. The fourth word which is important here is, is pro, pro, a program or a strategy or a vision. And I think in the way I learned, the one thing that I learned from this coronavirus pandemic is that like in every aspect of our life, vision is important, strategy is important. It's better to have a strategy that you will adjust or it was initially wrong, but you have the clear strategy rather than not, don't have a strategy. So the importance of strategy becomes, becomes a, an, an important issue. And I can continue here, but these are the basic important words that being scientific, being sharp and vigilant, being, a scient uh, being disciplined, very well organized, having a clear strategy of what we're doing. And the last, uh, the last thing that one cannot ignore is the communication with the public. You can have the best strategy, you can have the best success, but in this new world that everything, every truth can be manipulated, could be faked or presented in a different form, it's very important you have because who you are. Because if you are the executive power, you have to have executive power of communication to say the truth and to open the truth to the public. Because you cannot cheat the, the, the public here. I think it's very important that you say the truth, you base that truth on scientific evidence and share it with the public. That will give confidence because there's one important word that works here is trust. It's, it's important in every aspect of our life, but it's important when you have a pandemic and you have a relation between the power and the people. People have to trust you. People have to trust their government, their minister, and everything. If they don't trust, then you will have a problem. And then our colleague in, from Germany also announced about your economic, economic uh, responsibilities and the, or the difficulties that we are, everybody is facing. Absolutely true. And my take from all of these discussions and the discussions from you is, is yes, definitely. And this is the, the case when you have to act early and very sharply. Like the example with, with Germany was brought here. When every, every sector of life or every popular sector of life was thought of being supported, starting from those who don't have jobs or those that have daily jobs up to the big corporations. Because I think you cannot say, okay, big corporations, they are rich, they can manage it. They cannot. They are rich, they are big. And they have 10,000 workers, and that means they are, maybe they have a lot of money, but they have a lot of debt, and they have a lot of 10,000 people to feed. So every, everybody from one individual to up to the 10,000 or 50,000 and employee companies should be basically supported by the father of the nation, which is the government or, or the state. Equally, proportionally, so everybody will feel during the pandemic they are supported so they can survive and their jobs can survive. And the earlier you start, the better. Because every and each day, as in usual business, when you are in difficulty, every and each day, basically delayed, the same issue becomes twice as expensive or three times more expensive than if you could handle that before. So that's another lesson that I've learned. And of course, from Dr. Afeyan, what, what he, he mentioned here, it's important that there is an uncertainty. And I, I agree with Mr. Afeyan that we're living in a time that a, being an expert yesterday, well, you, could, you could have taken that as usual style, but today there are so many uncertainties. And I would like to add that, Nubar, that it's not only in the medical or, or, or the healthcare sector, it's worldwide in all sectors, because the world has changed. I think if there's an expert that could have told you how the stock market was behaving before classically, today is different. And I, all, all the, generally all other, not only pandemic, all other global risks are behaving. They are behaving non-classically. I call them quantum. 
well, uh, people are already heard a lot about this, but the reality is that we, we have to realize that we really know a lot, but we really don't know enough. We have also discovered that we are not the only inhabitants of this planet, <laughs> and we have uh, aliens, or maybe we are aliens, to viruses. So we have to learn how to live with other species and basically control them. And what I have learned as well, this wonderful world, words from Sir Isaac Newton, who said once to, to myself, I am only a child playing on the beach was fast, oh, vast oceans of truth lie undiscovered before me. So he said around 400 years ago, and basically still up to the day, there are oceans of undiscovered truth, and the behavior of pandemics or viruses is one of these un undiscovered truths. So I think there's a lot ahead to discover, I agree. But if I may just ask a question from our colleague. So knowing more or less or learning more or less what's happening in Armenia, what will be your advice to me as the President of the Republic or the Prime Minister or the government or the, indeed to the Minister and First Minister, Deputy Minister sitting here or the colleagues analysts representing academia, what will be your short advice in a couple of words to Armenia and Armenians? Thank you. Um, the question was, uh, what would you advise? A small country like Armenia may not have the same resources as large entities, large countries like Germany, United States, or Japan. What type of advices would you give knowing whatever you already know um, because of the past half a year that we're dealing with this pandemic globally? Uh, this question was for uh, our colleagues in Japan. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your question. And uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. But uh, as uh, uh, Deputy Health Minister mentioned, uh, your health system is underfunded. And uh, the health system is a key for the, the controlling the, the any kind of uh, infectious diseases. And uh, we were lucky that uh, we have uh, the very good access to healthcare. Uh, almost everyone the, can have access to the good healthcare. Uh, that's why the, we managed to identify the most of severe cases. And uh, that was uh, one of the important aspects for our the, the cluster-based approach. And uh, also the, our public health system is also underfunded, but uh, we still have uh, the good the public health network, and uh, we have uh, many the public health centers, and uh, the public health nurses are working very hard uh, for the contact tracing and the many other the duties. And uh, so these uh, infrastructure uh, are quite important factor uh, for the, our success so far. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. I'd also like to a little bit add to what Professor Ostan already said uh, concerning the uh, strengthening the health system. Actually, in 2016, when Japan hosted G7 summit uh, in uh, Iseshima in Japan, uh, one of the very important topic was uh, how to strengthen the health system by the collaboration uh, among among the governments and particularly emphasizing the importance of the universal health coverage. And the, this is actually intended uh, just for the normal situation, but also this also uh, contributes to the, our ability to address the crisis. So um, I think um, uh, this is still the really relevant in combating the uh, uh, COVID-19. And the, um, uh, because um, uh, uh, this uh, virus is uh, spreading all over the world, I think it's very important to uh, strengthen the international cooperation. And the, uh, Japan is very much um, uh, willing and they already doing uh, various uh, international uh, contributions, including uh, assisting uh, where necessary uh, the um, 
uh, strengthening the health uh, health system. Uh, so um, it would be great if uh, there's more sort of cooperation uh, between Japan and Albania as well. And we are very much uh, looking forward to uh, your success in your country. And the, uh, another thing, actually, you're already doing it is uh, exchange of experiences. Uh, so uh, Armenia uh, is really a, a great uh, uh, contributions uh, by uh, inviting this kind of uh, uh, experts to this um, uh, webinar. And this kind of uh, further exchange of uh, experiences, analysis, and scientific knowledge is, is extremely important. So uh, I thank you for, for that. Your advices, please. Nubaj, um, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Yes, can I hear can us. hear you. I, I can hear you. Okay. I was giving our colleagues who don't have as frequent a chance to interact with Armenia's uh, leadership to, to go ahead. But I, I would say just where we are, um, and I had a chance to speak uh, yesterday to the, to the health minister. Um, I do think that there has to be a, a, a thought given to make sure that Armenia is, is well involved in the planning that's going on vis-a-vis -vis vaccine access and vaccine distribution. Um, you know, there are large countries that are, and Europe particularly, that has collectivized kind of the effort. Uh, there are groups that are trying to deal with countries that are uh, even in, 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 in poor economic condition in Armenia. And so, you know, I do think that given the networks that Armenia has and, and the connections around the world, that it needs to kind of think of the job ahead, also with the communication that the president talked about, because, you know, just the, the populace has to be kind of educated and, and given the, the, the means to understand what the disease can do to them and also what a vaccine might or might not be able to help with. So. There's an education job to do, but there's also uh, looking ahead into 2021. Uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges of actually uh, potentially accessing and and making sure that the vaccines are are properly uh, reached. So I think there's work to do there, and, and and leveraging the relationships as you saw here with colleagues in Japan and Germany and elsewhere, all around the world. The U.S. will be important in that regard. So that would be my my uh, suggestion that that, that, that take on a, a serious phase. Please. Uh, Professor Loderbach, you're on mute. We, we cannot hear you. Well, thank you again. Uh, first of all, I agree with what my colleagues have uh, said in particular, um, the importance of preparing for vaccine access, because as soon as a vaccine is available or more vaccines are available, it will be important to be able to provide that to the population. If that provision is not guaranteed beforehand, uh, then obviously the population um, will feel left behind and we as Germans, we have made it quite clear that we do not want that those populations uh, get the vaccine that are in a position to best pay for it. There should be equal access worldwide. So despite the fact that we have uh, already um, engaged in a couple of contracts with possible vaccine producers later on, we fully support as a country and also as a member of the European Union that vaccines should be available to all countries independent of the wealth of that particular nation. Number two, in a more practical and more Im immediate uh, advice, I would really uh, try to, let's say, summarize what we have heard from Japan and from G Germany. If I was, let's say, asked to provide kind of an upshot. What, has, what do we know? Actually, uh, as I already pointed out in my own short presentation, my own short talk, the dispersion factors, the um, um, uh, eminent importance, eminent importance of super spreaders and uh, clusters of the infection. 
that is important to be taken into consideration. So that having been said, it is very important that the three C's, as my colleagues from Japan put it, they can best be addressed in, let's say, smaller settings by mask wearing and in larger settings by simply not permitting major venues, not permitting major crowds uh, for a reasonable period of time. I think it is wise to be careful when it comes to, let's say, allowing major crowds or major indoor meetings, because I think that is a very likely source of, uh, let's say, resurgence of the disease what, that we do not want to see uh, in, neither in Germany nor anywhere else. So mask wearing has been underestimated. Contact tracing, in my opinion, in, com in combination with mask wearing is very powerful and uh, avoiding or even making impossible by legal means major crowds, in particular indoor crowds, because indoor crowds is what is actually driving the disease. That should be uh, very carefully be monitored and if possible prohibited. I think that is a minor sacrifice for a major gain that we can gain in the population and uh, I think that uh, in the fall, we should all be prepared for a possible second wave, which we cannot in any way accommodate by a major lo national lockdown as we were able to accommodate the first wave. So the second response to a resurgence possibly in the fall has to be more focused, more targeted, and more intelligent that we should take into consideration what we have learned internationally from each other and the opportunity we had today, for which I'm very grateful to be part of, was an opportunity also for me to learn from you. And therefore, thank you so much for, for having me on your panel and sharing your knowledge and insights with me. Uh, thank you, Professor Lorderback. I want to, this is in the uh, last part of our webinar, um, 30 seconds as closing remarks, key takeaways. And we'll start with you, Professor Lorderback, and then we'll go down. So in 30 seconds, key takeaways from the pandemic and from this conversation. Well, uh, whatever you do, do it evidence-based, science-based, and communicate it in easy, transparent and honest language, then the population will follow along and you will manage the pandemic. In 30 seconds. Well, um, I agree with that and the, uh, uh, try to avoid the clusters, uh, try to avoid three Cs and have a good trust and communication so that people uh, can act their own and industry can act their own to try to do their business, but try to avoid clusters. I think that's a, a, a very essential, uh, should be our strategy. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Dr. Afeyan. Um, uh, let me comment about the, the little bit that the president spoke about the future. Um, I think despite all the darkness, there are opportunities that will be created through this, this massive disrupt, disruption and discontinuity that will favor the prepared minds. And it will, it will, it, I believe we will enter a zone of, of a new abnormal, not a new normal. And there will be people who are going to be seeking to renormalize. And there will be seeking people who, are, who will be trying to anticipate the new abnormal and be able to enable it. And be, so the new ways to do healthcare in the future and the new ways to do education. For a small country like Armenia, the opportunity would be great to leap into uh, being able to be a first mover in a new way of doing things as opposed to suffering from the lack of critical mass in the old way of doing things. So insurgents and incumbents will be waging a different battle in the future. And I think this disruption could be an opportunity for a country like Armenia to embrace that risk and try to get ahead. Thank you.
Dr. Petrosian, 30 seconds. Yeah, and uh, since we have to live with this virus for a while, I, I would like to ask the health sector and also our citizens to take some efforts not to disrupt regular care. Otherwise, we will have to be dealing with vaccine preventable diseases among children. Uh, so let's take efforts to go for regular checkups for vaccination program, including upcoming flu vaccination, particularly for vulnerable groups. Thank you. Ms. Abanesian. Most important things uh, that I am taking from this uh, meeting is that communication and cooperation are very, very important elements to have success. Uh, uh, to this vaccination uh, in the next year. So these two parts of uh, policy making and uh, everything that we do uh, are going to be a very important communication and cooperation. Thank you. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Well, I agree with, with all, all the colleagues that communications, but also being honest and true in your communications with the public is key here but not only here, but in our future uh, problems that we're going to face with economic difficulties, with other difficulties. Generally, there should be absolute trust between those who are running the policies and the people. Otherwise, all of the upcoming difficulties will not be manageable. That's one thing. And secondly, I do agree that Although Armenia is in the middle of this crisis, but I'm optimistic and I do believe that we agree with Dr. Afeyan that I, we as a nation being small, internationally hugely connected uh, with a lot of support of scientists that we have and professionals outside, we have a huge opportunity overcoming this problem and upcoming ones and be successful. But we have to start thinking and building the future, the strategy, the vision today. Mr. President, um, thank you for hosting this. Thank you for your foresight. Um, it's, uh, it's that type of a leadership that a small country in crisis requires. And I wanna say thank you to all of our colleagues from Japan, from Germany, from United States, from UK, Lord Darzi, and our colleagues here from Armenia, and, um, and everyone else that has joined us from across the world. Thank you for chiming in. Thank you for listening. I know you have a lot of questions. We're going to try to respond to them as uh, the session ends. Uh, we'll connect with you with more in the future. It's a difficult time for everyone, but as uh, Dr. Afeyan said, there is also an opportunity in this. I hope that we're all learning from these experiences. And again, Mr. President, thanks for opening your doors for this type of a engagement learning. Thank you for learning from the world, but also sharing our experience. We end on this. Uh, thank you. And then uh, thank you also Future Studio and all of our colleagues um, for organizing this. Until next time. Okay.